post-pandemic city is blank. So like you, uh, a little bit over a year ago, I was probably sitting you were probably sitting somewhere where you realized that your world was going to change. Maybe you'd been listening to um, news reports about a virus, um, about a pandemic growing in China. Maybe this had happened to your own family. Um, for me, I can think of three key moments that happened at the beginning of the pandemic that told me how my city and my life were gonna change. The first one was a call with my stepmother who is a radiologist and she said, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Put together a plan. It's easier to do a plan when you are calm, to enact a plan when you're calm. So do enact your plan when you're calm, get the things you need. You're gonna be hunkered down for a while. So that was the first moment and that was on February 23rd. And then related February 26th, I had my last meal with a friend in my restaurant here in Pittsburgh in the neighborhood of Lawrenceville. Then I had the last trip that I took. Maybe you had a trip like this too, whether it was to see your family. I went to speak to some of our alumni in Washington, DC and had that last moment of realizing it's not gonna be like this anymore. And then a couple of weeks later, we met as a leadership team at the university to talk about the possibility of our classes going online and off campus. And maybe the students perhaps would not come back from spring break. And 10 days later, things look like this. This is a group of people who are all over the world. Some of the people you see here are in London. Some are in Uruguay. Uh, there's one person in New Zealand and uh, there are some people in Seoul, Korea. There are a couple people in Wuhan, China. And all these people are everywhere all at once. And this became the kind of uh, experience that many of us have had, whether in workplaces or in classrooms or even design studios like where I teach. Instead, now I think we find ourselves in this kind, of, uh, this kind of moment where we're stepping out from inside the Zoom walls. I wanna give a uh, shout out to Lore V. She is a third year um, illustration student at School for Visual Arts. And these, um, this is an assignment she did for Tomar Honuka's class. Wonderful set of New Yorker covers. You can find them online. He's been tweeting them. And this one really struck me, um, seemed to be kind of the moment that we're in. So as I said, I've been asking people to fill in this blank. The post-pandemic city is blank. And I've got some interesting answers. In this talk, I wanna dig into a couple of them and use it as a way to frame the broader set of discussions we're having about what this post-pandemic city might be. First, the post-pandemic city is socially awkward. I need to give a tip of my hat to my teaching assistant, Karen Escarcha, who, um, who said that this was clearly what the post-pandemic city is. And it looks like the press agrees. Indeed, we find out over and over that we need to learn how to socialize differently. We need to talk differently. We've probably all had that strange experience of not knowing how to handle ourselves. It's like being on an awkward first date only with everybody and with every interaction you're having. It's a very strange time. And what we've learned is that over the course of, these, um, of this year, year plus, our social skills have gotten out of, out of whack. And moreover, we know that over time, loneliness and isolation can actually impact the brain. Um, it's been shown that uh, people who have smaller social networks or decreasing social networks may have smaller amygdala um, region of the brain. And, um, as a result, there are actual physiological effects. And while it seems that adults bounce back, we don't yet know how children are going to do or people with, with disabilities. The post-pandemic city uses biodegradable tech. Now, one thing we saw yesterday was some, uh, some really important work about the ways that automation and AI are gonna change architecture, change construction and change the city. But one thing that I think is important to realize is that we all use small pieces of technology every day. And in the pandemic, these, these smaller kind of disposable, compostable, biodegradable technologies that we all use are the things that get us through and are the, the elements on which mutuality is built. So I wanna tip my hat here to Nandini Nair, who is a master's student at Carnegie Mellon, um, working on a master's thesis on design for mutuality. 
And this term biodegradable tech comes from Christina Shi, who is a designer and rabble rouser and organizer in New York. Um, she's one of the people behind bed Strong, which is a group of 3,000 plus organizers and volunteer, volunteers and members who've banded together in order to help people through the pandemic. And they use everyday tools. So what you see here on the right, this link tree um, set of links, are link on the back end to a bunch of forms, a bunch of modular pieces of technology that come from out of the box technologies like Airtable, Google Sheets, Google Docs, um, Slack. Instagram, as we see, see here. In fact, Instagram has been a really important way for um, bed Strong to communicate with people. And what Christina Shi says about this notion of bio, biodegradable technology is that it's building the smallest tech footprint possible so it doesn't feel like a waste to leave it behind. She's acknowledging that it's a transitional moment, that we need it for this time only, and then we need to move on to what's next, and that this doesn't need to be such a big deal. It doesn't need to be precious. So when you look at bed Strong, for instance, you might see an Instagram story that talks about bed Strong's principles. You can also find this on a very simple text website. But here we see how they do the work, what the values are, and what they're holding space for as they design for support and mutuality. And indeed, if you look at the Instagram um, that they've been running over the last year plus, you see a lot of different kinds of stories, a lot of things that have happened from getting help with a vaccine now to getting baby essentials a few months ago. And Christina continues that this is also not trying, she's also not trying to create a service, or I should say they, it's, she's one of the many organizers. They're not trying to create a service that the public can become permanently reliant on. In our case, that means building tools for our organizers and our volunteers, but not like hosting anything for the general public or other groups. The post-pandemic city is working out the impact on work. And I think that we all feel this in a lot of different ways. Personal anecdote, my husband and I both work at home like many people do. He's a VP of product for a bridge, which is an AI healthcare company. And I'm a design professor. So we work usually, he's in the door, he's in the room right next to me. And we find that while I'm an extrovert and he's an introvert, he actually is really missing the daily interactions of a studio. And it's hard for him to feel creative and engaged. Um, without those kind of happenstance, happenstance interactions. A lot of us have realized that this moment makes us question what work is about. Indeed, we see numerous, numerous trends. I mean, any, any set of articles ranging from Harvard Business Review to umpteen articles in Forbes to anything, NBC, you see these questions about the inflection point of the pandemic or what trends are, are driving the post-pandemic workforce. And indeed, they tend to say the same things, flexibility. Um, flexibility will be required. Um, digitization will be required. But nobody really knows how we're going to get back to things. And indeed, some large tech companies have rolled back the bigger pronouncements they made about people working from home from here on out. McKinsey's done some interesting studies um, that look at the broader base and the issues around, um, around the future of work in the time of COVID. One of the first things, and this might seem quite obvious, is that jobs that rely on physical proximity may be subject to disruption. Certainly we know this from our, our restaurants and our cafes and our neighborhoods. In other places, such as the UPS store that my brother manages, they've made do and managed not to get COVID by being very, very careful about hygiene in a small enclosed space throughout the, the last year. And as we've seen over the last couple of days, and we'll see again today, these questions of growth and automation are at an all time high, especially around some of these um, jobs that used to be subject to um, human interaction. But we, we also see is less low wage job growth. And so we see a, a dangerous kind of situation here where we're going to see labor issues looking ahead. McKinsey also provides this particular um, chart that shows how these, how globally 
we might see these shifts happen. Indeed, I'm talking to you about these shifts from the perspective of the United States, but if you were in India or China, you might see a different set of um, changes and shifts happening in, in the workforce. There's some interesting tensions that begin to emerge as you, as you look beneath the surface between all of these different reports about what will change and what won't. And of course, we think about this question of flexibility and fixedness. We have questions about what will happen with our, with our downtowns, what will happen with that office space. It can't convert all that easily into living space. Living spaces have different kinds of footprints. So what are we going to see happen? We're going to see questions of what does productivity look like? We do feel product productive at home, or maybe even hyper-productive, some might say, but home might actually be a terrible place for some of us to work, and home care becomes an issue a lot of times for women or people of color or both who might have a harder or larger share of child care duties or other caregiving duties in the home. Home can actually be a difficult place to be. Analysis versus synthesis. We can analyze well when we're heads down and working on things, but to synthesize and to create, we need each other. And this is something that I find in the course of teaching design, that it's very, very hard to do that synthesizing conceptual work together, but that it's easier on our own to lock down and do the analytical work of describing or communicating our designs. So what kind of impact is that gonna have on design, on architecture? And then finally, the question of digital efficiency versus surveillance. Corporations will provide more digital infrastructure for, for their employees, but employees may also find themselves under a different kind of surveillance at home. There's always a question of whether even being on camera at home is a, possi is a possibility. This is something else we see certainly with, um, with students. So I might say that the post-COVID city asks what is meeting for and what is working for? And who do we allow to ask these questions? My next provocation is that the post-COVID city isn't a city, it's a suburb. And in fact, COVID didn't really change this trend. We see this trend starting in 2016 and actually it's continued apace. So what you see here in this 2019 graph from Freddie Mac is roughly the same as today. The New York Times reports the same kind of thing, although there has been a move away from uh, high cost areas like New York, San Francisco, San Jose, we've still continued a general migration pattern that started before the pandemic. And when we're talking about what it is for the post pandemic city to be a suburb, we're not talking about affluent suburbs, we're talking about first ring suburbs or older suburbs. I grew up in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, and Brooklyn Center, which is probably a place that many of you have heard of because of the murder of Dante Wright. Um, Dante, he was murdered in a, a city called Brooklyn Center. It's a suburb. Um, it has the highest percentage of people of color in the Twin Cities. It has a large Liberian population. In 1990, it was 90% white and had a 5% poverty rate. In 2021, it's 30% white and has a 15% poverty rate. That poverty rate has tripled in 30 years. And this is, this is not the only place that we see this happening. We of course see this in Ferguson, Missouri and other, um, other older suburbs. These are forces of resegregation, which is to say that the after segregation took place, there was a white flight to the suburbs and then whites continued to move and sometimes back to the city and these older suburbs tend to be places that have tended to um, have tended to fare less well. Um, and since these suburbs are sometimes isolated, Brooklyn Center and Ferguson may have more in common than they have with other suburbs around them and they find themselves acting alone. Indeed, the most diverse city in Colorado is a suburb, as PhD student Erica Dorn says, she's a PhD researcher at Carnegie Mellon and is researching the impact of um, technology and migration on our suburbs. I like this 1925 quote, it still rings true. It is the city trying to escape the consequences of being a city while still remaining a city. It is urban society trying to eat its cake and keep it too. 
So there are some things we need to do to fight the Fergusonization of suburbs in the post-pandemic city, in the post-pandemic suburb, making affordable housing available everywhere in a metropolitan area, caring better and integrating schools, <clears throat> moving away from raising revenue through traffic stops and putting aid where people need it, no longer in the inner cities, but rather in these older suburbs. Finally, the post-pandemic city is a myth. We might say, who's post-pandemic city? This is a coronavirus map from this week, and it shows just how large the outbreaks are right now in India, as well as in um, Brazil, Turkey, United States in the South. Here's Wuhan, China in some widely publicized images, but Wuhan was able to achieve the post-pandemic city through a lot of surveillance and locking down of narratives. This is from this morning in the New York Times. This is a catastrophe, illness is everywhere. These are not post-pandemic cities. The post-pandemic city is unevenly distributed. But I wanna point out that while the post-pandemic city is a myth, we need myths. Myths are traditional stories that involve supernatural beings or forces that embody and provide explanations, etiologies, or justifications for things. They explain the massive forces that move us. So in summary, the myths I've presented you with today show you that the post-pandemic city is socially awkward, but that means that we take care in coming back together as we re-engage that it's biodegradable. We look at biodegradability in the technologies we use, creating things we don't need forever, supporting community in times of transition, working out how we work, making productive use of these tensions we're uncovering and that we're experiencing in remote work and supporting new ways of working and equity and justice, supporting safe and just cities and suburbs for all residents and undoing the harms of resegregation. So the post-pandemic city in the end is about hope. Thank you. <laughs>